Muhammad was born into a culture where moon god worship was dominant. Furthermore, he was born into the Quraysh tribe, who were particularly devoted to the moon god. According to numerous inscriptions, the title of this moon god was al Ilah, which means the deity or the god, meaning that he was the chief or high god amongst many gods. al Ilah, the god, was shortened to Allah in pre-Islamic times. Now this part may be slightly confusing. Until now we have seen that in the Babylonian system the sun is always presented as a male god and the moon presented as a female goddess. And yet here we find talk of a male moon god, not a moon goddess. This is because there were certain branches where the roles were reversed. The male divinity became the moon and the female divinity became the sun. This form of the mysteries was particularly prevalent in Arabia and amongst the Saxons and Norsemen of Europe. This role reversal remained widespread around Arabia in particular long after its popularity had waned elsewhere. Echoes of this lesser known form still exist today. For example, Kush, Nimrod's father, was worshipped as a god under the title Mani or Manai, which means the numberer. He is accredited under the Babylonian system with inventing arithmetic. Now such has been the influence of the Saxons and Norsemen in particular on Scotland that we have a New Year festival that still exists today called Hogmanay, and this comes from Hogmanay, which means the Feast of the Numberer, who numbers the years. Another small example of how Babylon permeates our culture. Muhammad's father and uncle both had the name Allah incorporated into their own names. His father was called Abd Allah, and his uncle is called Obidallah. This echoes the Babylonian practice of incorporating your god into your own name and illustrates the preeminence of the moon god cult in his time. This fact answers the questions, why is Allah never defined in the Quran? Why did Muhammad assume that the pagan Arabs already knew who Allah was? The answer is because they already did know who Allah was. He was their moon god. Muhammad wasn't attempting to introduce the concept of a new god in the Quran, he was merely building on the one that already existed in, in the area. All Muhammad did was go one step further than his fellow pagan Arabs. While they believed that Allah, the moon god, was the greatest of all gods in a whole pantheon of gods, Muhammad said that Allah was not just the greatest god amongst many, but that he was in fact the only god. In effect, he said, Look, you already believe that the moon god Allah is the greatest of all gods, all I want you to do is accept the idea that he is the only God. I'm not taking away the Allah you already worship. I'm only taking away his wife and his daughters and all the other gods. Here is a picture of an Allah idol recovered in Arabia. Note the crescent moon on his chest. The pagan Arabs never accused Muhammad of preaching a different Allah to the one they already worshipped, and archaeological evidence proves that he was one and the same. The Encyclopedia of Religion says, Allah is a pre-Islamic name, corresponding to the Babylonian Bel. Allah is nothing more than Baal again with a new name. Muhammad attempted to have it both ways though. To pagans he said that he still believed in the moon god Allah, but to the Jews and the Christians he said that Allah was their god too. In effect it was the same technique that Catholic bishops had used to merge Christianity with paganism. Many Christians today have swallowed the lie that Allah is the same as the Christian God, when he is in fact Baal. Fortunately, Jews and Christians of that time recognized Muhammad's deceptive ideas and rejected Allah as a false god. Of course this angered Satan no end, and by consequence it angered his puppet Muhammad no end. And we know that when plan A, manipulation and flattery fails with Satan, he quickly resorts to plan B, intimidation and persecution. We perhaps never see this more clearly than in the relationship Muhammad had with the Jews. The Quran has a distinct split personality that correlated to two periods in Muhammad's life. At the start of his life in Mecca, he was relatively obscure and had no particular type of influence. He was in a position of weakness. In the second part of his life, he moved to Medina as a wealthy and powerful warlord. There, he was in a position of power. So all the earlier writings from his time in Mecca are generally peaceful. This was the period when Muhammad was in a position of weakness and trying to convince the local Jews that he was a prophet of their God, the Plan A years. 
all the later writings from his time in Medina, after he had risen to a position of wealth and power, are full of hate and anger towards the Jews who had rejected him. These are the Plan B years. He started calling for their slaughter and waged war against them, along with anyone else who rejected him or his message. Now it's important to understand that in Islam there is a principle of abrogation. This simply means that wherever there is a contradiction between verses and the Quran contradicts itself a fair amount, the later one cancels out the earlier one. So since the violent, warring verses are the later ones from his time in Medina, they cancel out the earlier, peaceful ones from his time in Mecca. This has been a great tool of deception for Muslims, as whenever they are challenged about the violent fruits of their religion, they point to the peaceful Mecca verses. In ignorance, the average person takes them at their word, completely unaware that those verses are effectively null and void under the principle of abrogation. They have been replaced by later commands to slaughter all non-believers and conquer the world. It is Muhammad's words and actions from the Medina years that fuel Islam's never-ending hatred towards the Jews and the problems in the Middle East. It is the words and actions of Muhammad in the Medina years that encourages and condones all forms of terrorism, lying, deceit, violence, murder of non-believers, oppression and domination as a service to Allah. Islamic terrorists are not acting contrary to the example of Muhammad their prophet. They are acting in perfect harmony with his own actions 1400 years ago. The Bible says that, You shall know a tree by the fruit it bears. The entire history of Islam has been littered with this type of violence, and when we look at the life of Muhammad in any detail, we will discover why. It produces bad fruit because it was a bad tree with its roots in the kingdom of darkness. The following are the recorded words and deeds of Muhammad. In the following example, we see Muhammad suddenly and conveniently receive a message from Allah to rape captured women. This event shows a particular audacity, permitting rape at the drop of a hat simply by conjuring a verse from Allah to support it out of thin air. Any whim or fancy that took him could be acted upon if he claimed he was doing it under divine authority or instruction. Muhammad understood what Nimrod and Semiramis understood, that spiritual authority gives temporal authority. Wherever Satan is involved, there is often a telltale hatred for the Jews, and this comes through loud and clear in Islam. Here, the unbelieving brother was seemingly impressed with Islam's ability to influence people to kill Jews and family members. This practice continues to this day in the Muslim community. Parents will kill children and brothers will kill siblings who leave Islam and call it a mercy killing. The brother in this instant converted on the spot, although we can't be sure he didn't do it out of self-preservation. Islam has a long history of forced conversions where the alternative is death. Muslims have been taught that their redemption will not come until all Jews have been destroyed, and therefore they will not stop fighting against them until they have reached this end. The prophet Ezekiel reports a time when Arab nations will team up with Russia to attempt to wipe out Israel. They will be driven to do this partly because of this prophecy. If the Jews are not wiped out according to Islam, their false messiah can't come. 
Do not be misled by claims of Muslims that their gripe with Israel is about land. Satan wants the Jews destroyed, as he has done from the beginning of time. He has hardwired this desire into the core of Islam through Muhammad, and they will work towards that end, no matter how much land Israel gives them. Muslims believe that they must kill all Jews, or their religion has been proved to be false. It's that simple. The United Nations are attempting to create a two-state solution where Jews and Palestinians share the land, but we know from our studies of the character of the satanic Jezebel spirit that it will not be content to share control of anything. It will have no equals. The goal of Islam is to extend its influence until it rules the entire world. In Islam, the world is currently divided into two, the House of Islam and the House of the Unbeliever or Infidel. They foresee a day when the whole earth will become Islamic and work continuously towards this end. The name Islam actually means submission, and this refers to the whole world submitting to the rule of the pagan moon god Allah, Allah being another name for Baal, and Baal being Satan. They believe that world peace will only come when they have triumphed over all the so-called infidel.